once upon a time, so long ago now that I cannot quite tell what is imagined and what was real, there came upon our town a dreadful plague. It began slowly. Where there are humans, so too will there be rats. And it took time before the townsfolk noticed an increase in the population, or that these were rodents of unusual savagery, capable of killing cats and seeing off the most seasoned of ratters. It seemed, too, that they moved with a certain agency, as though controlled by a governing intelligence. And this intelligence came at last to reveal itself. It was a single giant rodent, the size of a big man's arm, and that was without the tail, which itself resembled a thick grey snake, with a spur of bone upon his head, like a crown. This rat king took as his throne room an old grain store in the centre of the town, and surrounded himself with so many of his fellows that just to approach his lair was to risk injury or even death. In the third week of the plague, the mayor's baby son, barely a month old, was found in his cradle, his face half-eaten and his eyes gone from his head. As a final horror, the rats had placed one of their own in the child's mouth, a dead infant, pink and hairless, like a second tongue. It had helped to smother the child's cries. The corporation met in the guild hall. The mayor, silent at the head of the table, lost in his grief. And as the corporation sat, there came a knocking at the door. When it was opened, they saw before them a most peculiar figure. A man, tall and thin, clad in a surcoat, formed of patches containing every colour known to the eye. He was handsome in his way, but it was the thin, pinched beauty of one who was fading away from hunger. From his neck hung a carved bone pipe. The sight of him was so strange that it roused even the mare from his sorrows. "'What manner of man are you?' the mayor asked. The stranger spoke, and there was a kind of melody to his speech, so that he seemed to be singing rather than speaking his answer, but in time to a music only he could hear. "'I am a minstrel of sorts,' said the stranger, "'a piper. "'It has been given to me to charm the beasts of air and earth and sea.' although the gift works best with those creatures who are most cursed, snakes and spiders, toads and newts, bats, gnats, and... What about rats? said the mayor. The stranger thought upon the question for a moment, as though it had never before crossed his mind to consider binding a rat to his spell. Why, yes, he replied at last, rats for I perceive that you are sorely troubled by them. "'And what will you charge us for your services?' demanded the mayor. "'To lift this curse from us we would pay you ten thousand gold marks. "'No, fifty thousand. "'I would not ask so much. "'If you gentlemen are agreeable, "'I will write my price on a piece of parchment "'and seal it with wax. "'If I am successful,' You must simply promise to meet my price. And, oh, these sage elders, these guildsmen who prided themselves on their acumen, perceiving a bargain they believed they could not lose, assented to the piper's terms without further discussion. Into the street the piper stepped, the mayor and the corporation at his heels. The piper's eyes, orbs of blue-green, like stones from the ocean depths, flickered with an odd cold light as he put his lips to the pipe and blew three shrill blasts. And as the last note faded away, its place was taken by a deep murmur and a pattering and rustling as of many animal bodies jolted into activity. The ground 
shook beneath our feet. From every open door and window, every crack in a wall or hole in the ground, rats emerged, great and small, lean and brawny, brown and black, grey and tawny, and leading them was the Rat King himself, with his spur of bone upon his head. By now the piper had begun to play in earnest, and he danced his way to the gates of the town in time to the music, the rats following at his heels. When they arrived at the river, the rats plunged into its depths, and all were drowned, save for the Rat King himself, who made it to the far bank and scrambled over reeds and rushes until he found himself on dry land. For a moment this dreadful beast stared back at the town, as though to fix it in his memory, then continued on his way until at last he was lost from sight, and the piper's tune came to an end. The bells of the town rang out in celebration, and the mayor, who was a fair man, retrieved the piper's parchment from the folds of his coat, that he might read at last his price. He opened the parchment and stared at the words that the piper had written. His eyes grew wide. "'This is impossible,' he said. "'You surely cannot expect us to pay such a toll. Ten children, five boys and five girls. This was the piper's price.' "'You agreed,' said the piper, "'and so you must pay.' But armed men now appeared behind the mare, and the piper was forced to retreat, until he found himself once again outside the walls of the city, by a river clogged with the bodies of drowned rats. The gates were closed in his face, and from behind them came the voice of the mayor, warning the piper that if he were not gone by nightfall it would be the death of him. But now a confession... I did not witness anything of what I have described to you. I am blind and have been since birth. Of the piper's appearance and the extraordinary colours of his coat, of the yellow-boned hue of his pipe and the dead star light that flashed in his eyes before he cast his spell, I have only the word of others. I had always cursed my blindness until the piper came. Now I know that only my blindness saved me when he returned. He arrived in the dead of night. I opened my sightless eyes to the sound of his music, as did wake every other child in the town, and my feet moved in time to the piper's song. But the notes alone were not sufficient to separate children from their families for a child's love for its parents is stronger even than the spell of a piper, and so each boy and girl woke to a flickering before them, a wash of hues like a rainbow in human form. It was such sprites as these that finally drew them from their beds and led them through the streets to the walls of the town where the strongest among them opened the gates so that all might join the piper. And this they did, dancing to his tune, while the piper's ghosts frolicked around them, as a wondrous portal opened wide in the mountain above the town, and into this the children vanished and were never seen again. I know this because Jacob, the miller's son, as deaf since birth as I was blind, held my hand as we stood at the gate and spoke to me in his distorted voice of what he was witnessing. He stopped my dancing feet from following in the steps of the others, and I saved his sight from being bewitched, and so we were the only ones able to tell of what had occurred once the portal closed behind the piper and the sound of his music was cut off entirely. So I lived, and Jacob lived, but we never had children of our own. 
deep in the core of our beings was the knowledge that we had managed to thwart the piper, and the piper did not like to be thwarted. I have lived longer than anyone in this land. I am too old. But perhaps I have been kept alive for a purpose. Some days ago, a merchant came to me from the kingdom across the water and told me a tale. He was passing through the mountains above a remote village at the northern edge of his country, and there he beheld a strange sight, a blighted figure like a gargoyle, dressed in a surcoat of many colours, perched upon a rock. As he sat, this creature's hands worked on a length of bone, carving holes in it to complete an instrument, a pipe. The bone was small, but recognizably human, and the merchant thought that it might have come from a child's arm. While the merchant watched, almost spellbound, the figure cut and carved, chiseled and cored, until finally he raised the pipe to his lips and tested it. A distorted note emerged, and its creator, dissatisfied, returned to its work. This figure was humpbacked, the merchant said, with twisted limbs and the nose of a carrion bird, a crooked man. On a stone beside him stood a huge rat with a spur of bone on his head that he wore like a crown. The crooked man spoke to the rat as he worked. A new pipe, he said, for a new town. The rat licked at his paws in anticipation of what was to come, just as the crooked man tested the pipe again, this time finding its music more to his liking. Instantly he was transformed. His back became straight, his limbs adjusting their proportions to match his frame, his nose shortened, and the light of malice in his eyes was dimmed although it was not extinguished entirely. The merchant had seen enough, but he was not done with the horrors for that day. He both heard and felt a rumbling from the ground beneath his feet. A portal opened in the rock face, and from it poured forth an army of rats which gathered itself around the crooked man and the rat king on the stone. At the sight of them, the merchant turned to flee, but in doing so he lost his footing and tumbled down the mountainside, injuring himself grievously. He lay unconscious for two days and two nights, until at last he was discovered by riders from the village. They were searching for its lost children. The merchant left. He will spread the word just as I have tried to do in my own small way. Watch for the piper, he will warn. Listen for his tune, because he is coming. <laughs>